Welcome to the Carnivore Cast, a podcast focused on the carnivore diet and lifestyle, with practical advice from successful carnivores, citizen scientists, and top researchers. I'm your host, Scott Meslinski, and I'm here to speak with experts and experienced carnivores to get answers to your biggest and meatiest questions while helping you live your best life as a carnivore. This episode is brought to you by Element E Electrolytes. This month, we're switching it up with an exclusive offer that's only for VIP LMNT partners, including Carnivore Cast listeners. You can now receive this free sample pack along with any regular purchase when you use my custom link, which is provided in the show notes or my Instagram link in bio. That's drinklmnt.com forward slash Carnivore Cast, all one word. And as I said, I'll include the link in the show notes. LMNT electrolytes are convenient, evidence-based, and delicious. And get yours today to help support the show. Thank you. Ryan Talbot is an All-American decathlete for Michigan State University. After several injuries and health issues, Ryan began a carnivore diet in the midst of his decathlete season as an NCAA Division I athlete. He went on to win the Big Ten Championships on carnivore, break the school record, and compete in the NCAA National Championship. He's recently appeared on the Plant Free MD podcast with Dr. Anthony Chaffee and Casey Ryan on Boundless Body Radio. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so yeah, would love to hear a, a bit more about um, your your history as a decathlete. Where did that start and how did you get into it? I think the way I got into the decathlon was that in high school, I really enjoyed pole vault. I was really good at pole vault and um, I was actually the indoor state champion mm-hmm. um, my senior year. So I was great at pole vault and I also enjoyed doing other events and I would mess around with hurdles and shot put a little bit and long jump and high jump. So I didn't really want to choose only pole vault and I didn't know about decathlons until my mom told me about it. And then I started looking into it more and I started getting really interested and I talked to my coaches. Like when I was looking for colleges, I specifically told them like, I want to do decathlon. Cool. And yeah, so they don't offer it in high school. And I okay. that's why I didn't know about it until I got to college. Awesome. So you 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 came to Michigan having had you ever competed in a decathlon before? No, Anywhere? Never. Oh, yeah, cool. Never. <laughs> that's interesting. So were there any events that you like really had to work at and were like completely foreign to you? Yeah, I think um I would I like anybody can like do a long jump but not everybody can be good at it and i think that me trying to learn how to be good at it because i have a lot of speed i just needed to learn how to take that speed into the air yeah so that was a big struggle um i'm starting to really get it going though and um all the throwing events were completely alien to me but they're like some of the most fun events so it was not difficult for me to just fall in love with them and just try and learn as much as I could about them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's that's really cool how you were like competing as you were learning it. Um mm-hmm. and how many schools have decathlon or like how big is it as a college sport? Yeah, I, I think every every school offer it, but oh, wow. not every school is gonna have a coach for it. Not every okay. school is going to be able to like handle having like a big group of multis at the school. So it's it's a lot more popular for Division One, but mm. we'll still see Division Two, II, Division Three schools doing the decathlon. It's offered at um, a few meets out of the year, and cool. there's there's usually a lot of opportunities for decathletes. And what does the program look like at Michigan State for track? Yeah, and for decathlon specifically. Oh yeah, we have a great program for decathletes. We've um. We've won the decathlon in the Big Ten the past three out of the four years. Wow. And um, we have really good history of decathletes. And so our, our coach, Coach Creekmer, is a great coach. He he was a decathlete himself. Mm-hmm. And he knows a lot, a lot, a lot about the sport. Yeah. I know it's an Olympic event. Does it stem all the way back from like ancient Greece or where is <laughs> the history of decathlon? Yeah, I think I think um they did they did used to have a decathlon. I don't know if it was the decathlon or the heptathlon, but mm. they had a multi-event in the Olympics and 
it was a little bit different events. I know that some of them, the events you'd be like running in 50 pounds of armor and wow. you'd be doing like their fighting, their wrestling matches and stuff too. So it's a little different now, but they, they did have it back then. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, and I guess, did you play other sports growing up or primarily, um, pole vaulting? Yeah. I, um, like as a kid going through like, elementary school to high school I played football I played soccer for one year I played baseball for one year I played basketball a little bit too and then I I did a lot of track I did some lacrosse as well but then I, I kind of dropped most of those okay I got into high school and I started focusing a lot more just on pole vaulting got it and how tall are you and like what is uh what is a good height for a decathlete yeah, I, I, I usually think of like track, really good track runners as like a little bit shorter. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm six, six, wow. about 300 pounds. And it's definitely helpful to be tall for decathletes. And I would say also like a lot of like sprinters you'll see are tall and that's kind of like the body type of a decathlete almost is like, you're almost a sprinter but then you're almost a jumper as well. And like, that's where you're going to score the most points in the decathlon is sprints and jumps. Mm. So it's really helpful to be tall. And then also like throwing events. If you're tall, you're going to be throwing the discus so much farther. You're going to be having a bigger arm to throw the javelin and more distance to push the shot. But like, it's, it's very helpful being. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. I, I rode, um, all through high school and college. Um, I was on the lightweight rowing team at Penn. Um, and I was always, uh, not very good, but I worked very hard. Um, and part of what held me back is I have the opposite body structure of a rower. I have like a very long torso and very short legs. Um, (laughs) so I would be like a good wrestler or maybe a swimmer. Um, my wife is, uh, so I'm five foot ten. My wife is five foot three, and our hips come up to the same height. My torso oh, is just seven <laughs> inches longer than hers. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, I um I struggled, <laughs> but it's always interesting to hear how like different body types do really well in different sports. Yeah, for sure. I I think when I was at the national meet, like, at I wasn't even like the tallest guy there. I think. Wow. <laughs> it was like. I think there was at least one guy who was like six, seven. And then there were like me and a few others around six, six to like six, five, six, four. And then most of the guys fell in between like the six, two to six foot range. And there were, there were a few guys who were shorter, but yeah, it's really common to see tall guys. That's crazy. So you don't fit in with the rest of the track team. I imagine. <laughs> yeah, I am. I am the tallest one on the Michigan state track team. Yeah. And, um, I remember hearing that your parents were also athletes as well. Yeah, that's right. My dad did, uh, he was swimming in college and he swam sprints. And then my mom was doing heptathlon a little bit in college as well. Gotcha. And and did they both go to Michigan State? Yeah, they did. Oh, cool. That's great. A lot of, a lot of pressure on you then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not too much. <laughs> and um, what... um. I guess what type of education or guidelines have you had both in college and in high school as an athlete around nutrition? This episode is brought to you by Optimal Carnivore. Many people I talk to struggle to get enough organ meat on a carnivore diet. There's debate about whether you need to eat organs or not, but I like to supplement with organ meats and it makes me feel better and many carnivores would agree. Optimal Carnivore was created by Carnivores for Carnivores. In fact, I was consulted during the formulation, which is pretty cool. Um, They have a unique organ complex that combines nine different organs, liver, brain, heart, and more, um, all from grass-fed, grass-finished animals in New Zealand. And taking six capsules a day is the same as eating an ounce of raw liver. Um, And it's it's completely freeze-dried, and they use a very high-quality process to retain all the nutrients. You can use the link in the episode description or um, the link in my Instagram bio and use the code CARNWAR10 to save a checkout and support the show. Thank you. 
it's nice. My mom is a physical therapist, so she's pretty educated about that stuff. Um, my dad was a cyclist and doing some like semi-pro stuff with that for a while. So he got big into supplements. And so they kind of taught me this background knowledge of like, you got to have protein because protein is really good for you. And then also like when I was younger, we found out that I was allergic to milk and gluten Mm. and a few other stuff. So we cut that out of my diet. So I, I already had this like mindset of like, these foods are bad. These foods are good. I wasn't like to the point where I was like eating mostly carnivorous, but I was still yeah. eating like rice and oatmeal. Yeah. And then like not a lot of processed foods, not a lot of seed oils. Yeah. So it was like, it was a good diet to, and like the background knowledge from my parents was really helpful. Um, when I went to college, I started researching more about how to get stronger or how to build a strong body. And you stumble upon the bodybuilders of the internet telling you to eat chicken and rice every meal, you know? And so I think I went overboard and I started eating a lot more rice and oatmeal and carbohydrates like that, that I was, than I was used to. Um, And this was, this was also right near the time of, I had an injury and the medical staff at Michigan State gave me some ibuprofen and I was taking that at like every meal, wow. which is like pretty unnormal. I like, I usually don't do that. Yeah. And so that combination kind of started to give me some indigestion and yeah. led me to looking for the like new diet. Yeah. That's really interesting. You, I mean, that's a fantastic baseline to have um, from your parents and also just coincidentally being intolerant to like dairy and gluten. You're already eating like an amazing diet compared to 99.9% of kids. That's, that's really incredible. And uh, it's funny. I had something very similar. So starting my freshman year of college, um, I started having really bad back pain. I went to a bunch of physical therapists and stuff and, um, they all told me to take anti-inflammatories. So mm-hmm. uh, actually Aleve, not um, Advil. And I started taking it um, like two pills in the morning and night every single day for like three years. Yeah. Um, and that also did a pretty heavy <laughs> number on my digestion and also my hormones. I, I I feel like an idiot for not doing more research around it, but um mm-hmm. Like there's a lot of research that long-term use of NSAIDs can have those effects. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And like, luckily I only made it a week before I had to stop, but I, I, that was like one thing is I knew also as well, like I usually would avoid NSAIDs and anti-inflammatories and stuff like that. I would, I was staying away from that my whole life. And even when I got my wisdom teeth taken out, I only did a general anesthesia. I didn't go all the way out just because. Yeah. I didn't want to put those toxins in me, but at this point I was like pretty desperate and I was looking for any answer. So I ended up poisoning myself a little bit. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I mean, it's small price to pay for, for the lessons learned. Um, And then how did you, how did you happen upon the carnivore diet? Originally I had heard like people talk about like, Oh, Joe Rogan did the carnivore diet. And I was like, Oh, this guy's, crazy like I, that would never work i'm an athlete i need carbohydrates yeah <laughs> and then um that was like early on though and then at, so like going into last winter i stumbled upon a video of someone talking about how the carnivore diet cured their crohn's disease hmm. and i was super interested cuz i was like oh man like that's kind of crazy like i haven't heard of it curing diseases before. Yeah. And then, so I looked up some more and then I found out like, this guy's like, Oh, my alopecia is gone. Oh, like it's helping my type two diabetes. Oh, it's like helping this, helping that. I'm like, Holy cow. Like this is benefiting so many people. I started just watching hours and hours of videos on YouTube about it. Um, eventually I stumbled upon Dr. Chafee and also Dr. Baker. And both of them are, very like outspoken about the benefits for athletes and they're both athletic guys themselves. And so I saw that I was like, wow, 
I like I got I got to give it a shot at least, you know. <laughs> and um I feel like I'm someone who likes to experiment with unconventional ideas because I think that um you can improve so much if you're doing things that other people aren't. Yeah. So that was that was my idea. I was just going to try it and see how it worked out and it did amazingly for me. <laughs> That's really interesting. And how did you what was the transition like for you? Like, did you go kind of like zero to one? And how did you feel during that time? How was your training? Yeah. So um, originally I had kind of, I was, I was worried to go like full carnivore too quickly. And I was still like feeling like I needed carbs in my diet. And so I did fruit and a little bit of avocado with like the carnivore and um, so I was eating a lot, of, a lot more meat and still eating a little bit of fruit until I was full. And that kind of not, it, it didn't really let me get into that like state of improved fat burning and a little bit of like ketogenic, you know? And so I was still doing the fruit until the end of my indoor season because I didn't want to make a huge switch right before the indoor conference meet. And then as soon as that happened, I decided to completely cut out the fruit. And then my body went through like the keto flu and I like detoxed all these toxins from me. Like I had a rash for a little bit. I kind of like my nose was runny. I felt a little cruddy and then like electrolytes helped out a lot with that. And then also my workouts, like I was like sweating more during those, those few workouts. So I think my body was just getting rid of all of that. Interesting. And then the workouts helped a lot though. Like I didn't, I didn't feel like my performance decreased. I felt like I was just a little more fatigued, but like once I got past that point, I felt like amazing and everything kind of started to skyrocket from there. That's really cool. And, um, like what did your fueling strategy for like, because the decathlon, it's, it's two days. Is that right? What yeah. was your fueling strategy like before? Like, how did you, you have to be like pretty precise with what you ate, like the night before, the morning of, in between the events? Yeah, I think um, like obviously the night before would be like, okay, whatever the team is ordering for the meal is what I'm going to eat. So whether that's like Panera and I'm going to have to like, pick apart some salad or is it going to be like noodles and company and I'll get like gluten-free noodles. That's, that's like what it used to be. And then I would, um, then I would like carry around like a protein bar or some like fruit. I would have like applesauce and just kind of like sip on that applesauce throughout the whole like meat and stuff. And that'd be like all the first day and then eat whatever the team got for dinner the second that night and then how much time is there between events on the first day and like how long is the day it's usually like 30 minutes between events and um oh man the day can last it's usually more than like six hours i would say wow because like each event is going to take a certain amount of time and you get a required like 30 minutes in between and like events like the high jump take longer because more people are going to be jumping for longer compared to like the 100 is just done in 10 seconds. That's really cool. And, um, I guess how, how does that change for you? How do like, how do you eat around the events now? How is your energy and like your endurance, um, through the six hours of events? Yeah. Now, now it's really nice. I usually will just try and find a steakhouse or some place that sells burgers and just order a bunch of patties. Um, usually it'll be my meal before. And then that morning I wake up and I, I like the raw eggs. They're just easy. <laughs> so I'll do like, I, I was doing four raw eggs and then like a little bit of sardines or something like that. Super light. And I would try and get it in at least four hours or more before my competition and I actually found that like I enjoyed competing on an empty stomach. You know, you're not quite fasted, but you are starting to get to that point where your body's going to release a little more cortisol. You're going to be mobilizing more fat for more energy. And it's 
it's also anti-inflammatory, which is amazing. So I, I enjoy that. And, um, then I'll compete for a while and then pretty much by the fourth event of the day. So there's like five events in the first day. The fourth event is high jump. I'll eat just a little bit of, um, like pemmican that I make myself. And, um, and then I'm fueled for the last event. And then after day one, I'll eat a huge steak dinner and go to bed and wake up and do it all over again. That's amazing. And, um, do you have any like electrolytes during the event or anything like that? Yeah, I, um, I recently have started incorporating more electrolytes and it's been helping out a lot. I, um, I usually just super basic. I just take like a salt shaker. Usually it's like some Himalayan or Redmond or some salt like that. Shake it into a cup, get a bunch and fill with water, dilute it. And yeah, just straight salt works really good. Um, every once in a while I'll do actually, yeah, usually before I go to bed for that meat, I'll like do like a mixture of like magnesium, potassium, uh, chlorine kind of stuff. Um, and like all of those. And I think like a little bit of like loading too, if you do it the night before, it's going to help you a lot more the day of. Yeah. Interesting. I think, um, you you're at like kind of the forefront of testing this for yeah. endurance athletics. So it's like, there's not a lot of exact guidelines on like, you know, how to load electrolytes and stuff. So it's really cool that you're experimenting and like you said, kind of finding that edge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's, there's definitely like a point where, you know, you did too many electrolytes, <laughs> you got to run to the bathroom or something, but <laughs> other than that, I like, I don't really think there's an issue with, overdoing salt especially if you're like exercising and you're drinking water you're gonna go through it so quick yeah absolutely and um like do you find it's hard at all to meet like your caloric needs um outside of competition like during training and stuff like that um i don't think i have a huge issue with that uh, I definitely think that I'm going to try and do a, a little bit more with like dairy because I think that getting that lactose is good, even though it's going to bump up your insulin maybe a little bit. It's a lot less than it would be if it was just like sucrose or fructose. Yeah. Um, there's also got to be, I don't know, I think your body processes it a little bit differently. Um, but then also there's so much like benefit to getting a little bit of that. But when I was in season, I was just eating meat only. I was really strict and I, I didn't struggle with it at all. I think that, um, I was just eating until I was full. I was eating like three pounds or more of meat a day and a lot of eggs too. Cause I, I I really find benefit with eggs cause they have like every nutrient you need. Plus there's like so much good fat in those. Yeah. Super nutrient dense. Um, and have you find, found your body composition changed at all on carnivore? I think, um, I'm, I'm definitely more lean. I've put on a little bit more muscle as well. And, uh, I think, yeah, just that, that like carbohydrate water weight that you kind of hold definitely went away in the first like month. So I I think I lost like close to like 10 pounds, but like my strength didn't go away. And if anything, like my strength improved, my speed improved because I weighed less, you know, and I was able to jump higher because I weighed less. So amazing benefits with that. Yeah. I can see how that'd be a massive benefit for you, um, in your sport. And, um, I guess have any, uh, of like other athletes you've talked to or any of your peers been like, interested in in your diet or interested in trying this? Um, I think, I don't know. It's, it's like a big jump to take, you know, especially when you're doing something and like, if you already have success in the sport, like you, you shouldn't need to like go and jump off the cliff and change your whole diet around. But, um, there's definitely been like people talking to me about it. And I think if anything, people are just eating a little bit extra meat here and there. So 
a little bit more protein is still a good improvement, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's not black or white whatsoever. And, you know, moving in the right direction, like even someone with your diet, <laughs> like growing up would be in such a better yeah. place than even the average collegiate athlete. Yeah. Um, do you find it's hard to like eat this way um, being at school, like with school meal plan or like, how do you get most of your food? Yeah. Um, I like, I definitely noticed cause freshman year I was on the meal plan. I was living in the dorms. I wasn't eating very good because I was at the mercy of whatever's at the cafeteria. Um, but I mean, this was before I was doing carnivores, so I wasn't too worried about it. Um, but then like now that I'm, I'm not living in the dorm, so I'm able to cook for myself. And luckily like in Michigan, there's a lot of great farmers and I can get like grass fed, grass finished ground beef and source some of that stuff, get some eggs and all that from like local farmers. And so that's, that's really good and helpful. And um, I just thought of this, but are you anywhere near, you may not have heard of him, Tom Trainer. Do you know who that is? He's a, he's a trainer in Michigan who like trains a bunch of athletes, a lot of collegiate athletes, and um, basically eats like a carnivore type diet. Um, okay. And he's mostly on Facebook. I don't know if he's on Instagram or anything like that, but you might find him like really interesting. And like, Yeah, I'll, I'll check him out. Yeah, cool. yeah. He's, he's pretty cool. Um, and, uh, I guess what, um, what do you, what are some of your goals for like competing and, um, like your diet and continuing to learn and grow in different ways? Yeah, I think, um, for the track season coming up, like my goal is to continue the diet because it's been helping me recover and it's been helping me stay healthy. And I think that I'm going to continue to experiment like I said, like first off trying the diet was a huge experiment and it was a success during the diet. I tried to reincorporate like honey and that was unsuccessful. And like, I learned like, okay, it's going to cause inflammation. Like, yeah, I can handle that, but like, I don't want to handle inflammation in the middle of a big competition. So like know when to do it. I think, um, like I've, experimented with cheese a little bit experimented i want to like try raw dairy even though i've been allergic my whole life i've heard people have great results with it so give that a shot um like my my goals and track are that like i want to continue to be successful i want to win the big 10 again i want to finish top eight in the nation i want to qualify for the olympics that would be awesome in 2024 and cool. continue continue to train and just like i want to just do my best yeah that's really exciting and cool um yeah i'd be very excited to track your progress um towards some of those goals and, and the olympics i think that'd be so awesome um mm -hmm. cool ryan well uh thanks so much for coming on really appreciate it it's been great to learn more about you um, and I'm sure the audience will be interested in as well. Where can folks find you and follow you, um, for more? Yeah, I'm mostly on Instagram, just underscore Ryan, underscore Talbot, underscore, and just feel free to reach out and talk to me. And if you're a carnivore in Michigan, you want to get a steak or something, hit me up. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Well, I'll, I'll certainly have links to that in the show notes and thanks again for your time, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Carnivore Cast. If you enjoyed this episode, please review on iTunes. It really helps us out and share it with a friend. What questions would you like answered or who would you like to hear from in the carnivore research community? You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at CarnivoreCast or go to CarnivoreCast.com. You can also email me at info at CarnivoreCast.com. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, keep it carnivore.